Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. We're continuing to look at this passage. This, remember the big picture. We're giving this theme of 1 Corinthians, uh, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. They were imperfect. We're imperfect. The good news is that, that the power of the gospel is not dependent upon the perfection of those who, who are saved by it. We struggle with remaining sin, and the church at Corinth certainly did that. It's a perfect gospel, though. Saves to the uttermost, all who come by faith to Christ. We began looking last week at this idea of building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Remember when you go back early in the book, Paul is concerned. There are divisions in the church. They've chosen up sides over their favorite preacher. I follow Paul, some follow Apollos, some follow Peter. And there's a group that looks down on their nose at all of them and says, well, we just follow Jesus Christ. And it's, it's all handled wrong. So Paul's been addressing this idea of divisions, this controversy, the party spirit, the disunity. And he's hadn't, he hadn't finished that. In fact, you're going to see once we move beyond this passage into the next passage, it's still on his mind. It's on his heart. He's concerned about how the church at Corinth is manifesting its witness to a watching uh, Gentile world. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 to 15. Stand with me if you would. I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you, but also would love to put in your hands a copy of the Scripture so that you have your own copy of the Bible, God's Word. According to the grace of God given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And pray the Lord will take this passage today and, and cause us to search our hearts. Because here's the question we're going to... What are you building? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're building something. What are you building? Will it stand the fire at the end? Thank you. Please be seated. Well, as I said earlier, the, the discussion that be, he began in chapter 1, verse 10, is continually before him, the divisions. And he turns the discussion now, uh, though he still has in the back of his mind how they've bought into some of the sophistry, the so-called wisdom of the age. And they've decided to single out one preacher over another based upon the wisdom of the age, which he says is foolishness to God. But he turns the discussion to this notion of, of withstanding the blast at last, the fiery furnace of a judgment, to test and see what we built. So I told you last week, we began looking at this text under four headings, and I just want to remind you of them right now. First, there's this the grace necessary to build a God-glorifying edifice, we looked at that. Secondly, the, the only foundation worthy of building upon, we looked at that. We'll look a little bit more at that today. That is Jesus Christ. Then today, the, the spiritual quality of the materials used to build, verse 12, and then the reality of divine judgment upon our work, verses 13 to 15. Just would remind you briefly, Paul says his building, uh, this, this grace necessary, Grace was given to him. With all he's doing is carrying on, as we looked at Ephesians 2 last week, that we're, by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which the Lord has before ordained, that we should walk in them. He's, Paul says, I'm simply fleshing out what I was saved to do. Now, true, you have in Paul, the author of half the New Testament. Uh, none of us, uh, I certainly would not, I couldn't, I couldn't shine Paul's shoes or his sandals. But the application is true for all of us. All of us are saved by grace through faith if we're saved. 
All of us are saved not of ourselves, but as a gift of God. So none of us can boast about being saved. And all of us are created in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship. Remember, we preached through Ephesians years ago, and I told you this word workmanship is the Greek word poiema. I'm not trying to get fast and fancy pulling Greek on you, but listen to the word poiema. We get our word poem from that. If you're saved by grace through faith today, you're a poem. You stand and and people read your life and it talks about the grace of God in a unique way. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ locally and universally constitutes this fabulous anthology of poems of grace. You're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It's not saved by works. Works are the fruit, not the root of salvation. But they are the fruit. And so Paul is saying grace is necessary. Otherwise, you build completely in vain. If it's, if, if, the, if it's just a religious outworking, it's vain. But if it's the outflow of the grace of God in your life, which has given you a compulsion to build on this foundation, then thank God for his grace. Second thing he said, we began looking at last week, is there's only one foundation worthy of building upon. We sang about it last week. We sang about it again this week. I appreciate Josh mixing the, the, the great historic hymns of the faith and, and the newer hymns today that speak about Jesus as our firm foundation. He's the only one. No, no, other, no one can lay a foundation other than that which has, is laid, that is, has been laid, Jesus Christ. He's the cornerstone. We talked to you last week. If you know what a cornerstone is, you know anything about building, you know it is the, it is the stone that is laid on the foundation that gives you north, south, east, and west. Everything builds from that. Otherwise, it gets all askew. And he is our foundation. All of Scripture speaks of him. We're looking at that on Sunday nights, remember? As we're seeing Jesus in all of Scripture. When he, when he chided the Pharisees and said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have life, but I tell you, they testify of me, all of Scripture points to Christ, or points back to Christ. The Old Testament predicted and prepared for his incarnation. The Gospels tell the the history of his earthly ministry, the Acts, the history of the church in its early years, the epistles, that is the letters, one of those we're reading now, the commentaries on his message and work, the book of Revelation, the the final book of the Bible, it's the final testimony of his, his ruling and reigning and imminent return. He's the foundation. It's all about him. Paul's concerned because they're making it about themselves and they're making it about others, but not about him. And so he chides them for that. We told you last week as we closed the the service that Matthew 7, 24 to 27 is a bone-chilling passage because it comes to the end of the Sermon on the Mount where he gives a warning. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not practice them, Paul, uh, you know, Joshua prayed earlier, help us to hear with a, with a view to do, be doers of the word. Everyone who hears these words and does not put them into practice will be like a wise man who does put them into practice, like a wise man who built his house on the rock. But if you don't put them into practice, if you hear them and they fall by the wayside, you're like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Two houses, had you and I looked at them, could we observe them, you know, this past weekend, some folks found out some things about the foundation house was built on, didn't they? Big chunks of earth opened up under the floods. Jesus Christ is the foundation. We've got to be sure we build on him. And if we do, no matter how the storms come, no matter how the blasts come, no matter how withering it is, it'll stand. The foundation will not be destroyed because Jesus Christ is the eternal foundation. Well, another passage I want to add to that. It's 1 Peter 2, 6 to 8. We just read 1 1 through 12. The Scripture promised, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. In other words, if you trust in Jesus Christ, the world may shame you, the world may mock you, the world may, like it's happening to our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world, the world may kill you, but you will never Be ashamed before God. So the honor, he says, is for you who believe. But if you don't believe, 
Here's the deal. The stone that the builders rejected, see, the, the, the religious leaders of the day who said they were longing and looking for Messiah, rejected Jesus even though he was the chief cornerstone. He was the one everything was supposed to line up by. And so what happens, notice what it says. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, but for those who reject him, it's a, rock, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Saul, remember Saul of Tarsus? He was traveling around, uh, rounding up the followers of Jesus and having them stoned to death or put into prison. And he was on the Damascus road, and a voice came to him from heaven and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then the voice said, don't you know it's hard to kick against the goads? Let me Bill ask a loose translation. Don't you know, Saul, you'll break your foot trying to kick against me? You see, Jesus Christ will either be the stone that lines up your life by grace through faith, the stone upon which your life is built and, as an anchor, or it will become a stone that crushes you. I have remind you in the book of Revelation that at the end, that those who've rejected the Lamb will cry out for rocks to crush them, saying, Save us! Save us from the wrath of the Lamb. He is the stone. He's the cornerstone. Maybe, maybe wisely, by grace through faith, find Him as our foundation. Rest on Him. Stand on Him. Build upon Him. Well, look at number three. The spiritual, spiritual quality of the materials used to build. Now, this is, this is interesting language here. He says, now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, Wood, hay, straw. He's, he's lumped together six descriptives here. But he's going to separate them out. You would know if you've read the Old Testament that buildings were often built with precious metals and jewels. Just go back and read through the, the things that were gathered for the tabernacle. How the ark was built, the gold inlay. The, the temple building, how, what was gathered for the temple, these, how ornate it must have been. Precious. It was a house built to glorify Yahweh, and they wanted to give their very best. In fact, a fascinating thing happened when they were collecting for the temple in, in David's day. David says, who are we? <laughs> who are we that we get to participate in this, God? Because he knew God could speak from heaven. And, a, and an edifice like no one had ever seen would be erected simply by the word. And they actually had to turn them away and say, that's enough, we don't, need, we don't need any more. You see, we need to evaluate what we're building with. You don't have to worry about the foundation. If you know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that foundation is sure. It is, it, it is marble, it is granite, it is built upon the person of Jesus Christ and the finished work of Jesus Christ. What we should concern ourselves about once we have come to faith in Christ is what are we building upon this foundation? There's only one foundation, but there are many materials that can be brought to bear in the building of it. And as long as we're alive, as long as followers of Jesus Christ are alive, we are building. We're building something. Some sort of life. Some sort of church. Some sort of service for Christ. Fellowship in the gospel. It may be uh, palatial, it may be a hovel. It may be built with intention, it may be built by neglect. But every one of us is building something. When you look, if, if you study the history of churches, no two churches are exactly alike. I, some, every now and then someone says, oh, I just, wish, I just wish we had a New Testament church today. Well, which one? Corinth? Immorality? Denying the resurrection, taking one another to court. Thessalonica got so caught up in the second coming of Jesus that they quit working. Colossae, neo Gnosticism was taking over there and they were all bound up in rituals. And Which one? Philippi, two of the prominent women. 
had it out for one another with folks choosing sides. No two churches are alike, and all New Testament churches, all true churches of Jesus Christ, are flawed because they're made up of sinners saved by grace. So, so we don't need to pattern ourselves after XYZ church or this or that and the other, but we do need to be sure as Christians what we're building in our own lives and what we're, what we're building in the way of the church of Jesus Christ. From the very beginning, there have been Christians who were gold and Christians who were straw. There's two categories. This gold, silver, precious stones, it's high quality materials. Wood, hay, straw, nothing necessarily wrong with that unless you know the story of the three little pigs, right? Didn't hold up, did it? But this is worse than a wind. He's talking about a fire. Wood, hay, straw, doesn't survive a fire. Gold does. Silver does. Precious stones do. So he's talking about here, and he starts using this, this term of, of, of a reward, of saved and receiving a reward versus saved as though by fire or by the skin of your teeth. These do not represent wealth, talents, special gifts. That's not what we're talking about here. It's good. Thank the Lord for every one of those. Pray dear God help you be a good steward of using them. These are descriptions of how a believer responds to the claims of Christ upon his or her life. There are works. Again, not saved by works, but saved for works. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Works are not the source of the Christian life. It's not how you became a Christian, but they certainly are the marks of it. That's what James was going after, by the way. People don't like the book of James. He, had, he didn't deviate from the gospel of grace. Show me your faith by your works. In other words, talk is cheap. Every Christian's a builder. Every Christian is building with something. We know, intuitively, we know we should bring God our very best. And sometimes that manifests itself differently. I had a guy say to me years ago, well, I'll tell you what, I wear my Sunday best to church. Well, that, I don't know if that's good or bad. Sometimes I don't wear a suit, but I kind of got used to wearing a suit. And by the way, I don't wear a suit so that you say, wow, he's in a suit. No, I just comfortable wearing a suit. It doesn't make me any more holy than anybody here, no matter what you wear. You see, it's not, it's not the outward. It's the inward that flows out. Gold, silver, precious stones like pearls, they would be considered very valuable. More valuable than, than wood or hay or straw. What are we going to leave behind? What are we going to take with us? Those are really the questions, aren't they? What legacy will we leave behind when it's all been said and done? Did we live our lives for him? Did we leave a legacy, a spiritual legacy? A fellow said to me years ago when I was, I was a, a new father, this was a, an older pastor, wise man, he said, he said, young man, you have a lot of challenges in the ministry. This new challenge you have, to remember that the only thing he was, God has given you that, that you have any prospect of taking beyond the grave with you is this child. Everything else you'll leave behind. 
Everything else will be subject to the fire. What is valuable? What is precious? What will survive the fire? What kind of vessels are we showing ourselves to be? You know, we build. What's, what's the motive? Really, what's the motive? What's the motive for, for our building? What drives us? And we don't, we're not really allowed to examine one another's motives. Those are motives of the heart. No one can see another man's heart. Only the Spirit of God knows your spirit. But you know something of it. What, is, what, what's your, what drives you? Watch what gets us excited. Watch what gets us in earnest. Why do we do what we do? How do we do it? We looked at last week at 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat. How, how do we do it? Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Does this, this idea of the glory of God, does it, does it hover over us? Now, folks, not, not absolutely, but can, we are sinners saved by grace. We, we battle remaining sin, but when, when we are our best selves, is that what shines through? We build by our service. How do we serve? In the future sometime, we're going to do a study, maybe on Wednesday nights, on the one another's of Scripture. The one another's. Others. Think more highly of others. Do we realize that pouring ourselves in prayer and witness into the life of another and then having the privilege of seeing that person come to faith in Christ, whether through our direct witness or because we were part of the, we were part of the air support in prayer, that, that that's one of the most precious, most valuable gifts God gives. And then to walk along beside a believer, helping to equip, to disciple, to, to nurture, to bear one another's burdens. That's gold. That's valuable. It's the command of Jesus to be disciples who make disciples. How are we serving? Well, think about the materials of your life. It's not how much you have. It's what you do with what you have. It always has been. It's always been God's measure. You can read the parable of talents. It's clear that that's, that's in view there. When all is said and done, will I leave a legacy, a spiritual legacy? Will I be missed? Not for this and that, but will I be missed for gospel purposes? Will I leave a legacy? And who will I take to heaven with me? What am I building? Fourth, the reality of divine judgment upon our work. Look at verses 13 to 15. Each one's work will become manifest. For the day, this, this, that, that, the day is the day of judgment that's coming. It's approaching. We'll disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And it's interesting, Paul has taken this picture, this, this promise of the incendiary end. You know, if, if you read your history, that Nero... Uh, set Rome on fire and blamed the Christians for it. They're always talking about the fire. God promised he would not destroy the earth by flood anymore, but he would, he would come in, in a fiery judgment. So Paul uses this analogy to, to the, 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 the reality of it to turn it on us in terms of, of this, this spiritual purification and cleansing, this testing. It'll be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. It doesn't mean heaven's better for some than it is for others. 
But neither does it mean that any of us should have the attitude that I've seen in people. Well, I just, you know, I don't need a mansion. Just a little grass shack will do. It's a cop-out. But to be striving. We said last week, to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Rather than to hear him say, well, you barely made it, didn't you? No, well done, good and faithful servant. We want to, we want to, we want to hear that. If, anyone, if, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. It's interesting, isn't it? The picture there is one running, one running out of a house that's on fire, and you know that he's done it because he's, he smells of smoke. Salvation by grace through faith should afford a glorious entry. But not necessarily true of someone who builds with wood and hay and stubble. Fire is a symbol of testing. It purifies metal. The fire of God's discernment will burn up the dross and leave what is pure and valuable. And this is just real quick. There's some verses that just kind of... This, this idea of testing. Job 23.10, he, he said, He knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. That's thought would be the desire of every believer. Zechariah 13.9, I, I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. The people who have been tested and come up as gold and silver. New Testament, 1 Peter 1, 17, If you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. You, we call upon the Lord and we know that he judges impartially according to what we have done with what we have. Revelation three eighteen, the council of the church at Laodicea. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Buy from me gold refined by fire. No, it's not, salvation's by grace. But he's talking to a church there that they ought, to, they ought to invest and see valuable that which God says is valuable. We don't get to make it up. It's not a time of punishment. It's a time of reward. It's interesting, isn't it? That's all to encourage. You say, well, gee, I don't know that I've done a whole lot, preacher. You've done a lot more than you think. I'm quite sure. But think of this. His, his commitment is to save you. Listen again to verse 14 and 15. If the work, the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he'll receive a reward. So foundation, gold, silver, precious metal, blast of fire, it stands. If anyone's work is burned up, foundation is solid, wood, hay, straw, consumed by fire, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. So there's a sense in which, if, if that is true, he himself will be saved, then, then I can handle the loss, right? But only as through fire. And yet, so the commitment is to save each of his own, and he will. The challenge is that we not be content. Now listen to me, don't misunderstand me. That we not be content to say, well, at least I'm saved. But that we respond to this gracious gift of salvation and say, I am his and he is mine and my life belongs to him and God being my helper, I will live my life for him, not for me. I ask people when I talk to them about their salvation, here's timeline, here's your timeline. Talk about religious experiences along the way. Here, look at your timeline and ask yourself this. Along this timeline, when, if ever, has there come a time in your life when you could say, I ceased living primarily for me and began to live primarily for him? Not a day and a date necessarily, but a time. That's what the Scripture says a Christian is. He died for all that those who live will no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And if you cannot mark a time on your, on your timeline, say, I ceased living primarily for me and began living primarily for him. Not absolutely, not exclusively, but primarily. If that's not there, then you need to pray, dear God, 
Change me so that that will come into my timeline. You know, there's, I'm not gonna, I don't have time today to get into the different kinds of workmen. But there are constructive workmen. We've talked through the years here. What's in your bucket? When there's a fire beginning to, be, to stir in the life of the church, not the fire of, of, of the hallelujah fire of revival, but a fire of controversy, what's in your bucket? Is it water or is it gasoline? Are you a fire starter or a fire extinguisher? You a peacemaker or a peace breaker? Is it constructive? We all know people who think it's their purpose in life. Be critical to find fault, to undermine, to backstab. The scripture warns about them. We don't want to be those kind of people. I've known folks like that. You have too. And I've actually, I've actually asked a person one time, look, would you, would you just, can we just pause and you lead us in a word of criticism? Because you know they will. That's what they're good at. But edifying, building up, speaking well of, is it constructive? Is it with eternity in view? Or is it here and now? Well, let's look real quickly these ideas about this crown, this reward. 1 Corinthians, they're going to go fast with me now, 1 Corinthians 9.25. Every athlete exercises self-control in all these things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, an imperishable, the idea being an imperishable wreath, imperishable crown. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 says, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. Boy, I, I won't be able to say that when I come to the end. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. Not only to me, but all to, who have loved his appearing, long for his appearing there. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting, but our joy, our Lord Jesus at his coming? You are our glory and our joy. And it, what do you look for in heaven? Oh, I look for, I want, I'm longing to see Jesus, and I want, I want to bring others with me. That's what Paul's saying there. 1 Peter 5, 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And then James 1, 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. These, these genitive forms here, the crown which is life, the crown which is glory, the crown which is exaltation, the crown which is righteousness, it's, that, that's, it's enhanced as we make our way to glory. We want to be constructive. Constructive workmen. I want to build for Jesus Christ something that will last. And I don't necessarily have an edge over you because I'm a pastor or a preacher. He measures us on the basis of what we do and what we have. And to whom much is given, much is required. You may know C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd was a missionary, a uh, uh, pretty, pretty good cricket player, uh, but a missionary to Hudson Taylor's Inland China Mission. He's the one who famously said, some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. He wrote a poem, I want to read, and we're going to close with this, called Only One Life. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart, and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. Yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord, to meet and stand before his judgment seat, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still, small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say only one life 
will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep. In joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife. Pleasing thee in my daily life. For only one life will soon be past. And only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn. And from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne for only one life. It will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. Yes, only one. Now let me say thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say "Twas worth it all. For only one life. It will soon be past. And only what's done for Christ will last. What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? We only have one. We don't get replays. And I pray that you're building. I don't want to say something to you. I'm, I'm, be sure that when I'm teaching you this, I'm not thinking, why oh, do you folks need to measure up? No, I'm looking out and I'm seeing people who are so precious. And you're so faithful. And you do things at a level that Sometimes I know about, many times I don't, but heaven always knows. And I thank God for you. But oh, I, want, I want you to finish well. Don't give up. Renew. Recharge. Press harder. Salvation, ultimate salvation is closer now than it's ever been. And I want for you and I want for me for us to go hard and finish with full force and fury building something that will last beyond our time on this earth. For those here who are not yet Christ followers, your building begins by simply, in a childlike way, trusting Jesus Christ, saying, yes, Lord, have your own way with me. I want to be yours. I want you to be mine. I want to take up the journey. I want to begin to follow you. I want to begin to build for you. And I pray that that will happen in your life if you're not yet saved, but that will happen soon for you. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we look at this passage here, and Lord, to think that, that the fire of your discerning examination is going to come upon every person who names the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, God, I pray for me, I pray for my brothers and sisters, that when the fire, when the blast comes, that there will be a substantial spiritual building standing. Lord, I pray for me and for my brothers and sisters that it won't be a matter of where, where what we've in, invested in and spent time will be like wood and hay and stubble and go up in smoke and run down in a nail hole with a foundation and, and, a, and just a, a flickering ember of salvation. Though that... That is glorious to think that even in the blast of your discerning furnace, your grace is enough. Oh, raise up men and women and boys and girls here to live committed that we only have one life and it's passing us by faster than we think, that the only thing that will matter when all is said and done is that I live my life for you. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.